water. With the heating up of the world year after year, the ice on the North and South Poles begins to melt. The volume of the ice in part above the surface as a solid block begins to turn into water and go into our oceans. This logically has a direct effect in the rising of the sea level, which poses a significant threat to specific countries across the world in two different categories. First, continental countries with coastal areas below the sea level already, or at least low-lying ones that would become below sea level with the rising of the oceans, and two small island countries that have the entirety of their habitable territory under sea level in these scenarios, causing them to effectively disappear off the face of the earth. While the situation would be dramatic for both, it's somewhat fixable for the first, they can either move their population to higher territories or easily develop ways to keep the water away, like the Netherlands did with their land reclamation policy. Don't get me wrong, it wouldn't be pleasant or easy, but at least it's more doable. However, for the latter, it would be near impossible to fix, even though they're trying as we'll see ahead. There's no higher land to escape to. Their small size and island nature makes a lot of the land reclamation technology inapplicable or very difficult to use and so a drastic rise in water levels only means one thing disappearance so in this video we're going to take a look at some of those countries that might disappear being pushed underwater First, Kiribati. Kiribati is a Pacific island nation located northeast of Australia. A fun fact, it's situated near the equator and straddles both the international dateline and the equator line. It consists of 33 atolls and reef islands dispersed over 3.5 million square kilometers of ocean, but its total land area is only around 800 square kilometers. As is the case with many small island nations, it's tremendously small in land when compared to its ocean or EEZ territory. However, it's still home to over 100,000 people. With an average altitude of only 3 meters, the water currently rises at a rate of 1.2 centimeters a year, four times faster than the global average, which makes Kiribati the most likely country to disappear due to high rising seas in the forthcoming years. So what will happen to these 100,000 people and to a sovereign nation when the sea just eats them up? Well, there's no real solution as of now. The local government is trying to implement a plan to raise their altitude or at least build sand and rock blocks to keep the water out, but estimates place the cost at billions of dollars, which they just don't have. They're trying to raise money from outside investors, but it's been difficult. They argue that the rich countries that have done the most to cause the climate crisis should pay out for the solution. A similar situation happens with the Maldives. They are an island nation located in the Indian Ocean, southwest of Sri Lanka and India. They occupy an area of 298 square kilometers, previously having been a Portuguese, Dutch and British colony, gaining independence in 1965. They have the lowest average altitude of any country in the world, just 1.5 meters, and their highest point is 2.3 meters. Their population is almost 350,000 people though. The possibility of increased flooding, saltwater intrusion, which would lead to the loss of access of fresh water and the potential loss of land poses a significant threat to the country. Estimates claim that by 2050, 80% of the country will be uninhabitable. They have already implemented several measures to combat this, including building a wall around the capital of Malay and beginning a large-scale land reclamation project in Uu Malay in preparation for a relocation from elsewhere in the country. Also, a Dutch company has proposed building 5,000 floating homes, which could be the best solution, man-made islands. Now before we keep going with the video, I want to tell you about the brand we partnered with today, Planet Wild. Planet Wild is a global community of people who care deeply about the planet and want to give back to nature. Every month they help bringing back endangered species, clean up our oceans or restore forests. These missions are funded through a monthly membership which allows anyone to support their efforts. Something I really like that sets them apart is that they document every mission in video, sharing in detail what what was invested, where and what was achieved, as well as what the long-term goals are. They also don't just jump into an issue on their own, but rather partner with existing conservation projects around the globe, supporting their already existing work. They're also transparent about funding. 91% of the funds collected through memberships are distributed based on the community's vote and spent in four impact areas. Forests, oceans, animals, and awareness. The remaining 9% are their service fee. 
So if you want to contribute to help preserve our world and existing environment, become a Planet Wild member today. The first 200 people to click the link in the description will receive their first month of a Planet Wild membership for free using the code KNOWLEDGE7. Now back to the video. And if you thought the first two were in trouble, wait until you hear about Vanuatu. The Republic of Vanuatu is the country most vulnerable to natural disasters, according to the UN. With just over 12,000 square kilometers, the Pacific Ocean Archipelago was discovered by Spanish sailors in 1606 and became independent in 1980 after being ruled together by the UK and France. One of the big issues they face is that they have a high rate of cyclone formation. Some time ago, a cyclone devastated 90% of the capital city. But seawater rising is also a key issue for the over 200,000 people that live there. I was honestly shocked by how populous these small island countries are. The nation's reliance on agriculture further emphasizes the importance of climate resilience for their survival and sustainable development. The solutions they've started to follow are similar to these previously mentioned. In addition to those, some politicians and activists are advocating to take a stand against major polluters by pursuing legal action to seek compensation for the losses and damages caused by climate change. Their focus is on wealthy nations whose carbon emissions play a significant role in driving human-induced climate change. Moving away from island nations for a couple of minutes, we have a key example of how continental ones might also be affected with Bangladesh. Bangladesh is in the top 10 of countries most vulnerable to climate calamities, surpassing some of these small islands. Their high vulnerability is due to a combination of geographical factors such as its flat, low-lying and delta-exposed topography and socio-economic ones, including its high population density, levels of poverty and dependence on agriculture, the latter being a common factor on this list. Their government estimates that by 2050, one in every seven Bangladeshis will be displaced due to climate change. That's over 13 million people. They're already preparing with the construction of shelters, embankments, and training volunteers. And like I mentioned at the start, they're not the only continental country at risk should water level rise too much. China, India, the Netherlands, Vietnam, Portugal, Indonesia, which has a sinking capital, Jakarta, although climate change only plays a role in that, Thailand, Nigeria, virtually all countries that aren't landlocked are in some degree of risk, higher if they are poor, if they have low altitude territory, and a concentration of people on their coasts. Back to the islands, we have the Marshall Islands, an associated state of the US, a tiny Micronesian state with an area of 181 square kilometers, over five islands, with 29 atolls in the Pacific Ocean. Their average altitude is also only two meters. Presently, with its population of 60,000, some residents are facing impending submergence by the sea level rise that has already begun. It is most visible in some atolls, which have already been submerged. They're trying many of the same solutions, mainly rising the land. The challenge is that when you depend on agriculture and or freshwater extraction, you can't just raise it enough for the seawater not to flood it. You have to raise it enough and in a manner that the groundwater won't be penetrated by salt water, making it more difficult and expensive to do. Similar situations are found in Palau or the Seychelles. In these two, albeit not exclusively, not only do they face all the previously mentioned issues, but also an additional one of the ocean water getting warmer, which might cause the destruction of corals and disrupt the ecosystem even more and even cause the extinction of some fish species. If agriculture is made impossible by the penetration of salt water and fishing is impossible, it becomes very difficult to get food. Palau is a little safer when compared to the others here. Most of the country is situated 9 meters above sea level, but the rise of the waters is still a high risk to the country's economy, ecology, and the life of almost 20,000 inhabitants. In the Solomon Islands, the risk is also one of the highest, as they currently rank the second most at-risk nation for natural disasters, in part because a high proportion, 65% of the population, lives less than one kilometer from the sea. Not only is the whole country at a low altitude, but the coastal concentration means that this issue will be a problem sooner rather than later. Its proximity and close ties with Australia have helped here though, and the Australian government has committed to help them. They have invested millions of dollars in energy projects, agricultural protection, as well as infrastructure. If the help will be enough, remains to be seen. And finally for this video, 
Tuvalu. Tuvalu situation shows how unfair climate change can be. Even though it produces very little pollution, I believe it's actually the country that least pollutes in the world, it's heavily affected by global warming. Discovered by the Spanish in 1568, Tuvalu became independent from Britain in 1978. They're composed of four coral reefs, five atolls, and three islands in the Pacific Ocean. They continue trying to improve their coastal resilience with construction, but it might not be enough. According to some estimates, the highest tides could regularly flood 95% of the country by 2100. The rising salt water could also destroy deep-rooted food crops before that. They are one of the only, if not the actual only one, country to follow the rules of the Kyoto Protocol entirely in order to assert their innocence in the consequences of climate change in the sense that at least they did all that was in their power to do. So. Those are some of the countries in the world, almost all of them small island nations, that might disappear with the rising of the sea level. Stopping the rising of the water sadly seems unlikely, if not impossible right now, and so the only solution is coming up with a plan B or a way of dealing with it, finding out how their territory might survive or where they might move to. As we saw, some options are building walls to keep the water out, raising the land altitude artificially, proceeding with land reclamation projects, or simply building floating cities and or artificial islands. In addition, other coastal countries will also suffer from this, especially those with low altitude areas, those that are not that rich, and those that have population concentrated on the coasts. Similar solutions will have to be followed by them in order to avoid similar disasters and a complete loss of vast coastal territories along the world, as this map shows could happen if the ice were to completely melt. What do you think of these potential solutions for the problem? Do you think richer countries should pay for having polluted more? Leave a comment letting me know. Thanks for watching the video, subscribe to catch future ones, and I will see you next time for more general knowledge.